unless they have something instead of violence and war, they will go back for violence and war every time. My name is Gene Sharp, and this is the work I do. This is a technique of combat. It is a substitute for war and other violence. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Iran. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Egypt. As we speak, somebody is doing it in Venezuela. I'm telling you the facts I know. To be counted as a threat to a tyrant is a matter of pride, I would say. It means we're effective. It means we're relevant. It means out of this very small office, we produce work uh, that, that threatens regimes. Gene Sharp's tactics and, and, um, and, and theories are being practiced on the streets of Syria as we speak now. Unless they have something instead of violence and war, they will go back for violence and war every time. The momentous events of 1989 have begun to force, and I mean it, force a recognition of the power of nonviolent struggle. But not from everybody. We still have, particularly American politicians, who claim credit for the momentous events in Eastern Europe for the American military policies of the last 40 years, which is a preposterous claim, or say it's a victory for capitalism or we've won the Cold War, when the credit for those uprisings belongs to no one else but the brave peoples of Eastern Europe. And the movements in South Africa, those tremendous events, still incomplete, still partial, still a dangerous situation. The credit for that goes to the brave Africans and other South Africans who have struggled by nonviolent means predominantly in recent years. There was a time when ideas of nonviolent struggle were dismissed as naivete, as utopianism, as moralizing. And whenever we had a significant case of nonviolent struggle, there was always some reason to dismiss it as not being of significance. It was exceptional circumstances. The Indian struggles for independence with the assistance of Gandhi, but conducted by millions of people, were dismissed because the British were always gentlemanly. <laughs> and they didn't know of the massacre of Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar, where the soldiers fired machine guns into a peaceful crowd until they ran out of bullets. 
or the civil rights movement, the courageous movement that developed under circumstances in which no one was predicting a mass nonviolent self-liberation movement of Afro-Americans with their Euro-American allies in the Deep South was dismissed as, oh, well, this occurred in a democracy as though the South in those days was a democracy. <laughs> and although the racism of the Southern pale-faced bigots is comparable to Nazi racial theories, and although Afro-Americans had been victims of lynchings and murders and other types of terror, for decades and decades. So that struggle was dismissed by many people as not really of greater significance. People have said, particularly intellectuals, that there's always some reason why nonviolent struggle was impossible, they used to say particularly because of our supposed animal nature, which I always claimed was an insult to the animals. <laughs> <laughs> or because we didn't all believe the right religion or have the right interpretation of the right religion or the right political ideology, or we hadn't grown up in the right educational system, or we hadn't had the right kind of toilet training, and on and on and on down the line. But as Kenneth Boulding reminded us years ago, that which is, is possible. <laughs> but many of our people have not quite grasped that yet. And so when we see increasing demonstrations of the power of nonviolent struggle, which I argue is not merely the equal of violence, but potentially infinitely greater. We see that those people are now fewer who can claim the naivete of nonviolent struggle. Is shaking governments to the point that they disintegrate and nobody is left to surrender naivete and weakness? Are people cowardly because they don't use violence when they, like the brave Burmese students and other people in Rangoon, continue their demonstrations bringing down three successive governments in nonviolent defiance before various problems in the movement and more brutal repression caused a temporary halt. And I cannot forget the students in Tiananmen Square. What about the bravery of the Poles who struggled for over 10 years when all our sophisticated correspondents and editors with exceptions, the New York Times reporter was here the other day, said, well, solidarity's dead. We know that. Even one famous peace researcher pronounced that. There's nothing weak about a technique of struggle which take, can take the legitimacy away from an oppressive government which can produce a defiant population uncontrollable by the police and military forces sent to repress them. There is nothing weak about paralyzing an economic system or immobilizing and causing to fall apart a political system or inducing disaffection in an army this is the Chinese people bravely did, perhaps for the first time in human history, caused a whole army to stop, which was invading the capital of their country, and turn around 
and go back. There is nothing naive about making repression against nonviolent people rebound to weaken the power of those who gave the orders for the repression. People sometimes speak of nonviolence, which is not a word I like. It's too vague, sloppy, etc., etc. Nonviolence, and then there's armed struggle. And of course, everybody knows armed struggle is more effective because you've got something to fight with, and you've got nonviolence, you've got an absence of something. I say nonviolent struggle is armed struggle. And we have to take back that term from those advocates of violence who try to justify with pretty words that kind of combat. Only with this type of struggle, one fights with psychological weapons, social weapons, economic weapons, and political weapons. And that this is ultimately more powerful against oppression, injustice, and tyranny than is violence. This is a technique of combat. It is a substitute for war and other violence. It is not compromise. It is not nice conciliation. It is not negotiation. Those measures are all appropriate in various situations and stages of struggles on various types of issues, other means of conflict resolution. That's all fine. But nonviolent struggle is reserved for the particular area of activity when people would otherwise feel they were required to use violence. And a lot of our theories of just war, etc., are based upon an assumption that violence is the most effective thing you can do, even though you might find it bloody, immoral, etc., poking holes in people and all that kind of thing, but you have it as a means of last resort. But that is based on the assumption, an empirical assumption, that violence is really the most powerful. And that is another claim that I deny. That people and governments will, organizations, liberation movements, will not give up violence for nothing. They will adhere to violence because they want the things they believe the violence can give them. And neither social revolutionaries nor national defense strategists nor ordinary people in your neighborhoods will advocate complete unilateral disarmament, abandonment, all violence and war with nothing there to take its place. But there is something there that can take its place and not pious sentiments. And it does no good to lament violence and war or recount how violent our country or any people have been and say, isn't that terrible? If you do not have a substitute means of struggle which people can adopt for the goals that they want. This is a very complex technique. It has a long history, some of which has been lost but some of which can be retrieved. And we have been denied that knowledge of much of the history of nonviolent struggle because it wasn't in our history books. I still hear political scientists at distinguished universities say that, of course, it you're not claiming it could have been used against the Nazis, are you? In total ignorance of the fact that it was used against the Nazis in Norway and other places. And this wonderful case that Nathan Stolzfus is researching on the defiance of women in Berlin who saved their Jewish husbands by defying the Nazis on the streets a few blocks from Gestapo headquarters. And people do not know. Nonviolent struggle is not rooted in altruism. It is not rooted in ethical or religious nonviolence or higher moral development. 
nor does it require a charismatic leader, and a charismatic leader may even be a disadvantage, I would argue, in nonviolent struggle. It does not require a change in human nature, whatever that is, or some personal transformation, although that's great if it can happen, or some prior social revolution or religious conversion. Indeed, the identification of nonviolent struggle with all of those things has done over decades a positive dis disservice to the practical growth and development and utilization of nonviolent struggle because they've said, well, I couldn't be a Gandhi or I don't believe in pacifism or you know, whatever it was. And instead, this type of struggle has historically been used by ordinary people who were capable of extraordinary action and capacities. And I agree with my military friends that this, there is more similarity with, between nonviolent struggle and military struggle than there is between nonviolent struggle and just a general attitude of being gentle and peaceful. <coughs> this is possible for two reasons. One of these, I'm going to give you one now, I'll give you one later. One of these that it's rooted in a great capacity which we all have with the exception of few of the saints who are among us today. And that's the capacity to be stubborn and obnoxious. <laughs> Saying, no, I won't do that. Or, yes, I will do it and you're not going to stop me. But doing that on a social, political, and economic level and that makes it within the realm of achievement of ordinary people. This is a technique, I, I've listed 198, but my goodness, there must be 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 that haven't even been cataloged and documented, and new ones are always being invented. Some of those are very mild, symbolic, going into street demonstrations and passing out leaflets and may be very dangerous as it was in the streets of Panama. But they're still weak. And then there are the stronger methods of non-cooperation and defiance and intervention which are often capable of disintegrating regimes. And one has to choose carefully the methods most appropriate to the situation the issues and the opponents. Because if you choose the wrong ones, it won't work. Strategy is crucial. Not just doing what we feel like we must do. Not just showing that we disapprove of what's going on or we're trying to witness against it or suck, have people gain support because of our self-suffering on a variety of other egotistical perspectives. This is a technique which can, at times, change hearts and minds. And when that happens, that is beautiful and powerful and lasting. But it also is a technique which can alter social and political reality to force negotiations, to force a settlement, to coerce the opponent, and even to disintegrate dictatorship. There has been more done by nonviolent struggle to liberate people from communist dictatorships and other kinds of dictatorships than anything the Pentagon has done with all of its billions and billions of dollars for 40 years. And yet we can't even get a five or ten million dollar budget to do some research in this field. But there's a cost effectiveness uh, quite extraordinary of the nonviolent struggle compared to what military struggle has done to wield power. Nonviolent struggle is growing in the world because it is rooted in an understanding of the nature of political power. And this is the second major origin of nonviolent struggle. Because political power is not intrinsic to the people who hold it. Tyrants, beloved presidents, 
generals, queens, or whoever were not born with secret police forces by their bedsides to do their bidding, or nuclear weapons, or all sets of prisons and concentration camps in which they could put anyone who wouldn't do their bidding or bring them their milk on time. But the power of those people has derived from sources in the society, from the belief they have the right to rule, which the Chinese students were destroying in China. The belief in that right to rule results in cooperative human assistance, obedient and semi-effective, at least, bureaucracies. The powerful rulers are not born with armies at their disposal. And yet these are the sources of their power, the cooperation and submission and obedience of hundreds of thousands and millions of people and thousands and thousands of organizations and institutions of the society in all aspects of the society. And what non one thing that nonviolent struggle does is to mobilize all the people of society who want to participate as fighters and resistors, and so that every institution of the society, whether it's educational, economic, religious, sports, what, African violet clubs or whatever, can join in as organizations of resistance in a crisis. So the aggressor or the tyrant becomes confronted by the whole society, its organized power, and which takes away then the power that that tyrant thought he, it's usually a he, had, and it's gone. And that causes great confusion and problems of psychological adjustment of people used to giving orders and everything happens and then nothing happens. And rem it's a long time ago, but I'm reminded of Tsar Nicholas in 1917, the February Revolution, the revolution that brought down the Tsar system. And it wasn't October, it wasn't Lenin, it wasn't the Bolsheviks. It was the predominantly nonviolent revolution in February. And Tsar Nicholas in his railway car giving orders to his generals put down this revolution tomorrow. And when tomorrow came, there weren't any soldiers effectively obeying orders for the generals even to give orders to put down the revolution. Because the sources of power, the pillars of support, had been taken away. And in this way, nonviolent struggle is far more effective than violence because it strikes at the roots of the opponent's power Etienne de Boitier in the 16th century, maybe at the age of 18, wrote this essay, Discours de la Servitude Volontaire, sometimes translated as Discourse on Voluntary Servitude or anti dictator It's very dramatic, and I'm tempted to dramatize and elaborate on it a little bit. But he said very simply, if you want a fire to go out, don't put any more wood on it. <laughs> if you want a plant to die, I'm, this, he didn't have that one, don't water it. Some of you are very good at that. <laughs> if you want a tyranny to collapse, don't obey it anymore. Don't give it money in your taxes so that it can bribe other people to do dastardly things against you. Make the emperor really naked. And when people grasp that power, then they will understand that violence is not the ultimate source of power in politics, which some of the realist theorists have tried to tell us, but rather that people and their organization and institutions are. And then when they withdraw that cooperation, when they restrict or sever the sources of power, the power of their opponents is restricted or destroyed. Strikes, boycotts, economic shutdowns may cripple the economy. The religious and moral leaders of a society may 
convince the population that the regime is illegitimate. The civil servants may walk out of their offices or carry out their own orders in harmony with their ideas of freedom and constitutionalism, ignore that of the usurpers or the invasion. And as in Poland, underground institutions and printing presses and systems of education may remove large sections of the society from the government's control. People cannot be ruled forever against their will if they are finally able and willing to act upon that will. That's not to expect that because you are being nonviolent, the tyrants and oppressors will welcome your behavior. Because what is happening is that the people are mobilizing what was their power potential, but unutilized into effective power, and that strikes fear because it strikes at the heart of their capacity to even maintain their positions, much less to carry out their policies. And so repression is to be expected. You often hear the ration, the excuses. Oh, we tried nonviolent means, but they beat us or they shot us and had a conversation before I knew who he was with Franz Fanon in a car Ghana in 1960 and he said well we in Algeria we tried nonviolent means we had school boycotts and we had some labor strikes and the French troops came in and they beat us and shot us and put us in jail and so we had no no alternative but go to guerrilla warfare and violence well Franz Fanon was an incredible speaker and he was very brilliant but on this point, you didn't know what he was talking about because when they did the guerrilla warfare and the first thousand or 10,000 or 200,000 Algerians were killed by the French, they didn't give up guerrilla warfare. When their casualty rates would have been, we know approximately from other historical cases, infinitely smaller with nonviolent struggle. And look at the casualty rates in Poland in 10 years of struggle. I don't know how many were killed, but it's a handful of people compared to what it would have been if the Poles had risen up as many people would have predicted from the, well, some versions of their history with a violent uprising. They would have not only been massively slaughtered, but there would be no democracy in Poland today. But when this happens against nonviolent people, when people are slaughtered, when they are beaten, this produces a process of what I call political jujitsu, in which the opponent's supposed strength is used to undermine the opponent by alienating more people from supporting that regime mobilizing more people into the active resistance. There was a recent example in Prague in November when the Czech, one of the demonstrations, the Czech riot police, maybe you remember, came out and brutally beat demonstrators who were demanding free elections and democracy in Czechoslovakia, and it was bloody and it was terrible. And yet it is reported that those very beatings were what galvanized the political opposition to the hardline communist regime. <clears throat> and instead of people being intimidated back into their living rooms, they mobilized more powerfully. So then there were hundreds of thousands of people who came out to demonstrate on the streets of Prague. As one student put it, the beatings were the spark that started the whole movement. And within weeks, in the face of the massive repudiation, the Communist Party was forced to relinquish the presidency and the majority of its cabinet positions. And the former prisoners became government leaders. But is this all relevant to dictatorships? 
It's always been known by people who didn't always know that extreme dictatorships were supposed to be immune from this type of activity. That was a foolish view because we didn't read Aristotle. Aristotle said that a tyrant wants his subjects to have no mutual confidence that is in each other, no power, little spirit. And however, despite the measures which are taken by tyrants to deny subjects those capacities of self-confidence, mutual reliance, power, and great spirit, still Aristotle observed, oligarchy and tyranny are shorter lived than any other constitution. Because there are inherent problems in dictatorships, inherent weaknesses, which in the long run contribute to their weakening and their disintegration. And had we paid more attention to those insights in how to deal with dictators and aggressors, had we devoted one thousandth of one percent of the resources that have gone into developing military hardware to developing that political insight, dictatorships would have long since vanished from this world. Because dictatorships are not as omnipotent as their leaders, or sometimes our leaders, want us to believe. As the events in Eastern Europe and South Africa have demonstrated most recently, we should give credit to Karl Deutsch, important political scientist who back in the 1950s was listing us about 17 weaknesses which totalitarian systems had, which would lead to their gradual weakening or disintegration. And David Reisman was saying similar things. But nobody who was supposedly concerned about the past Nazi totalitarian system or Mussolini's or the Stalin system or any of the rest of them bothered to pay any attention to that. Which leads one to wonder what was the great belief in freedom and democracy if we didn't have the wisdom to identify when they were pointed out to us weaknesses of those systems and they'd say, how can we help aggravate those weaknesses? How can we utilize those weaknesses to advance the cause of freedom, how can we, et cetera, et cetera. But instead I remember, I don't know whether it was in the fancy journal articles or books, because I didn't read them then, but I remember people when they were developing our nuclear and hydrogen bomb military strategy in the early, late 40s and early 50s, it was justified because it was said if totalitarian systems ever get control of a society, their control and their indoctrination of the new generation will be so complete that they will be virtually permanent. And therefore it is justified to risk disaster with preparations for nuclear weapons in order that we can prevent that, at least deter that. And other versions of it are that you have to send foreign armies in to liberate people, although that has really never worked. It was foreign armies that went into Nicaragua in the 1920s who set up the very military establishment which later became the basis of the Somoza dictatorships which contributed to all the rest of the problems in Nicaragua ever since, and this is true in many other cases. But we could, if we wanted, develop programs for the prevention and elimination of dictatorships. We could develop a post-military weapon system rooted in these psychological, social, economic, and political means of combat. But even though we have not done those things, nonviolent struggle has moved ahead. There is an increasing cross-fertilization 
and mutual stimulation of nonviolent struggle throughout the world. And the pace is accelerating. Of course it's growing. Of course it's expanding. A few months ago, I was at the newsstand buying a newspaper. The guy that there is a nice guy. He doesn't know what I do. He said, you know, this guy was in here the other day talking to me. And he said, hey, there's something screwy in the world. The people without guns are winning. <laughs> now, when that awareness gets down to that level in our society, spreads that widely, that people without guns have the power to win, something fundamental is changing in our world and has already changed. And this power and growth of nonviolent struggle can no longer be denied. It is now the advocates of violence that have to justify the accusation that they are the ones that are weak. And the this is not a criticism of military people whatsoever. In fact, it was one distinguished military officer who's in this audience today, who said years ago, he wrote about the increasing political impotence of military means. You can't do decent political things with military, large-scale military weaponry anymore. But you can with nonviolent struggle. In fact, if you look at the events from Tallinn to Nablus, from Rangoon to Santiago, from Pretoria to Prague, or Beijing to Berlin. Those events in recent months and years cannot even be described, much less understood, without attention to the role of nonviolent struggle. You know, we used to hear, but there's India, and there's Martin Luther King and Civil Rights Movement, and maybe there was something else. They might have remembered the brave women of the women's suffrage movement who went to prison and went on hunger strikes in England and the United States to get the right to vote. You know, They might even have remembered the slave slowdowns and e evasive action to reduce their economic utility to their white masters. They might have remembered the growth of the labor movement, and a whole series of other cases. But mostly they didn't, and they were scattered things throughout history. But just since 1970, politically significant nonviolent action has occurred with increasing acceleration. And they have proven that nonviolent struggle operates, that it can be effective, it will not win every time, then it can work in industrial as well as agricultural societies. It can work against invaders as well as internal usurpers. It can work for liberty, and in some cases we have seen it can work against basic human rights. But this does not mean that nonviolent struggle is foolproof. It does not mean it is a technique that is always successful, that it is without cost that it is without casualties. There are risks of defeat. It doesn't, is not a type of activity that is effortless. And indeed, overconfidence, naive presumptions, ignoring of its requirements, neglect of the dangers, poor strategy or the absence of strategy, isolating, it, isolating ties to specific doctrines ideologies or religions, or mixing it with counterproductive violence, can all contribute to defeat. And so, whereas I see this great historical movement of more and more nonviolent struggle becoming increasingly effective, there are dangers, because it could be reversed. If in fact, the growth and practice of nonviolent struggle is often outpacing the extent and depth 
of our knowledge or the widespread knowledge of its requirements and its dynamics. If there's a lack of strategic planning, if there are false expectations, these will increase the chances of failures or make the successes very small ones. And if a series of those failures occur, it may help to disillusion people from what they will then say was this naive hope. Steps can be taken to prevent that from happening, to reduce the chances of a major reversal of this great historic movement. And I do think that it is not, not at all an exaggeration to say that we stand at the crossroads of history at a point which perhaps has never been reached before. When, although the nonviolent struggle is not a panacea, no nonsense like that, but that it is possible for us to continue the old path of relying on violence in extreme conflicts, the path which has led not only to wars and the threat of extermination, but the internal consequences of these institutions to wield violence to oppress their own people. That that reliance can change. And we can shift for purposes of liberation, for purposes of achieving social justice, and defending our societies from internal tyrants or foreign aggressors to nonviolent forms of struggle. But this requires us to do more than say, gee, isn't that nice? Wouldn't that be great? It means that we have to do a variety of things, not all of which are dramatic, but all of which are important. We have to take this technique of nonviolent struggle, which in spite of its accomplishments, historically and in these, particularly this past year, and regard it essentially as a crude and primitive technique and learn how to refine and develop it to make it more effective than it has been in the past. Just as the nature of military struggle has been transformed since the time of Sun Tzu, because people put their minds and their resources and their manpower in those days to the development of how you fight militarily and have a greater chance of winning by producing greater power capacity. How do you develop new weapons? How do you organize people into effective fighting forces? What are the principles of strategy and tactics which you must use or not use or in which situations how do you choose? How do you learn from past defeats as well as from past successes? And through all of those kinds of efforts, war has been transformed into a capacity to destroy that was never imagined by the early pioneers of organized military warfare. And I'm saying we can do that with nonviolent struggle. We can minimally multiply the effectiveness demonstrated in the struggles in whatever country you want to name, Poland, Eastern Europe, South Africa, other cases in the past, minimally multiply that power and effectiveness 10 times over. Because in most cases, these people had little or no resources, little or no knowledge. They didn't have the handbooks on strategy or tactics from which you can learn some general ideas and some general possibilities to adjust to your situation. But this requires things that are boring to some people, like research, basic research. Find out what is this type of struggle, what makes it work, what, what contributes to its failing, to what are its requirements, what are its strategic principles, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the possible opponents that we might need to confront 
with this type of struggle. So you study the, as basic research, dictatorships and systems of oppression. How problem-solving research, for example, how can it be made more effective? How can a movement continue to grow towards victory in spite of massacres and brutal repression? How can people best persist in struggle while maintaining nonviolent discipline? We need a new generation of young scholars who will prepare themselves to be rigorous academics and policy analysts to study these questions. We need policy studies in advance of crises as to how to use this kind of struggle against future threats. How could this be responsibly applied in conflicts where the other choices are violence or passive submission? How could it best be organized for toppling dictators, often in a specific country, in a specific issue, like China or like Burma? How can the transition to new institutions be made after there's a successful nonviolent struggle? So you don't have a wonderful nonviolent struggle as in Iran and then get a dictatorial theocratic dictatorship afterwards. And the Iran is not the first case where that pattern has followed, has been followed. Russia is, a, is one, uh, there are several others. How can nonviolent struggle be effectively utilized as a component in the defense policy of a country that believes for various reasons that it still requires its military forces? What should that role be, and how can it be limited? But what of the countries that are already open to the possibility of a more rapid transition? And Panama, if it has no army, must have a civilian-based defense policy. And Costa Rica has been in a very vulnerable position for 40 years, very lucky, no army. But what would happen if? And then they would either organize one very quickly or they would call on the United States to come and save them if the United States hadn't, didn't, wasn't part of the problem itself. <laughs> How can we prevent and defeat coup d'etat? Most governments in the world today have come in by military takeovers. The very organizations that were set up supposedly to defend the country have been turned to attack it and establish a new oppression. How can nonviolent struggle advance social justice, achieve land reform? People need access to knowledge. There is a hunger for knowledge about nonviolent struggle all over the world today. Or the military officers who instead is the following the stereotypes of peace movement people against military officers. I hope you've uh, some of you have had those stereotypes destroyed this weekend, but eager to examine what is the nature of this taking? What is its potential? How can it operate? And so we need a massive program of education about the nature and potential of nonviolent struggle in a whole variety of ways, more ways than I could list if that was the only thing I was mentioning, but formal classes, informal courses, popularizations of bigger books, simplification, translations into languages, which is often expensive. But you know, the Middle East conflict, up until about six years ago, I was reliably informed, I think reliably, by my Arab and Israeli friends, there was not one book in either Hebrew or in Arabic on nonviolent struggle. And can we wonder that in that conflict there was not more interest in something and confidence in something other than violence? And this, we need whole national information programs. We need something I'm calling intensive educational efforts for groups that are in conflict situations so one could work intensively with a relatively small number of people who might become the leaders or the thinkers behind the movement for greater freedom, when otherwise they would live for decades under dictatorship, 
or they would continue their self-defeating efforts to use violence. But they don't get that knowledge by osmosis or intuition. There are concrete efforts that can be taken, consultations and meetings and articles, all kinds of handbooks. We need the resources of the knowledge of nonviolent struggle to be disseminated, and this requires greater re financial resources. Whether it's a trade union organization, a church, or whatever it is, that thinks this kind of work is important should be contributing financially to some group and some organization, and our federal government uh, should be doing the same. If we just look at the money that the United States government has spent and is committed to in Panama, because they supposedly didn't know any other way of getting rid of this character, it goes up into the billions of dollars, specific money is needed for development of nonviolent struggle because this question of what are you going to do if you're not going to use violence is the most crucial single issue related to world peace and to human freedom and justice. We need many efforts at self-education, the training of young scholars, the self-organization and action of oppressed people, quality training programs. And then, as has happened already in Sweden, governmental consideration. What is, are the options here? But with all of these events, the genie is out of the bottle. There is now an increasingly worldwide recognition that the power of people under some circumstances can do amazing things can disintegrate dictatorships, can able, enable people to liberate themselves. And this will have long-term and very significant consequences. We also need to pursue specifically much in much more detail and care the development of civilian-based defense. But I have another confidence, and that is that when people really begin to understand the power of nonviolent struggle and its capacity in deterring attack and defending successfully against it, those little components will gradually be expanded and increased as people gain, not dreamy-eyed, utopian hope, but realistic confidence based on the reality of the power of people struggling for their freedom, that those small components will gradually grow from 2% to 5% to 10% to 25 and then the issue will gradually become well, do we need all of this military weaponry if we are so politically indigestible already? And like many of the armaments of war in the past, of bows and arrows and swords and suits of armor and all that kind of thing, they, this modern military weaponry, which is so expensive, will be seen to be sort of antiquated and unnecessary and self-defeating and, and provocative of an attack. And so it can be relegated to the new military museums. While many of people in the society, including some of the military officers, join in actively to continue the development and the refinement of this new concept of national defense, which has the potential then of eliminating war, not only by the countries that adopt it, but by successful demonstrations, sometimes painfully, of the power of this defense policy will make military aggression a very costly 
project, when it is capable of spreading the ideas of nonviolent struggle from the defender's homeland back into the attacker's homeland. And so people there will say, we can liberate ourselves also by such means. And this will all produce a great change. People armed with the ability to organize and work together to solve problems will not need someone to come and save them, whether it be the government or the party or the newest leader. They will instead be capable of solving their own problems of saving themselves, even under extreme circumstances. And as people gain and experience their power potential, they can tackle problems and work for permanent changes that cannot be taken away from them by someone else. And this popular empowerment will enable people to revitalize freedom, to make it more durable and genuine. It will make it possible for them to end systems of social oppression by direct popular nonviolent efforts which turn helpless victims into masters of their own destinies. And this capacity can also empower even potential victims of genocide and others to resist successfully any future efforts at extermination. Popular empowerment will also help people to cast off and remain free from internal and foreign domination. They can make major acceptable changes in political society without waiting for generations or centuries. This type of change is a process in which people are acting to shape the present and simultaneously are increasing their ability to determine their future. This route is no panacea. There is no easy path. There is no guaranteed safety. There is no assurance of success in every respect and on each occasion. However, the possibility exists that we can deliberately contribute to the development of a new stage of human history. We can resolve acute problems with which we have been so long confronted. We can be on the verge of a new departure of human capacities which we can develop if we wish in order that people can regain or perhaps for many to achieve for the first time the capacity to control their own destiny.